During the 80s, there were a plethora of holiday-oriented horror movies to pick from, but you know what was lacking in that department? Valentine's Day. Thankfully, George Machaca and the whole of Canada was ready to fulfill that need. A picturesque little town of hard-working people harbors a dark and twisted history, as well as a mine where a killer miner waits to exact revenge. This is my review of My Bloody Valentine. The movie begins in a mine where one of the miners working there wants to get kinky. Please note, the amount of will it took for me not to make a minor joke here. Turns out that her partner of choice has a different kind of penetration in mind. Now it's the 12th of February and a bunch of miners are just getting off work. Look at this. Bros being dudes. And not a CEO in sight. Their first stop is to greet their girlfriends who are decorating for the upcoming Valentine's Day dance. Here we meet TJ, played by the late Paul Kelman, Axel, played by Neil Affleck, Howard, played by the late Alf Humphreys, Hollis, played by the late Keith Knight, Sarah, played by Laurie Hollier, Patty, played by Cynthia Dale, Gretchen, played by Gina Dick, and Sylvia, played by Helene Udy. There's also Mabel, played by the late Patricia Hamilton, who's in charge of this whole festivity. The mayor, played by the late Larry Reynolds, who also happens to be TJ's father is also on board, and so is Chief Newby, played by the late Don Franks. Apparently TJ had left for a while, and now that he's back, his father has him working in the mine. During TJ's absence, his ex-girlfriend Sarah got with Axel. Before the mayor leaves, he gets an anonymous valentine, which doesn't hold chocolate, but an actual human heart. Meanwhile, everyone's hanging out at the bar as any small town residents would. Happy, played by the late Jack Van Evera, is going to be playing the part of the ominous warning ignored by the youth. He tells the group that this Valentine's Day celebration is a bad idea as it's a cursed day. He even tells them why. In 1960, while the town was having their dance, there were a group of miners trapped in the mine due to a methane explosion. Weeks were spent attempting to unbury them, and only one was found alive because he had resorted to cannibalism. Harry Warden, played by Peter Cowper, was sent to a mental hospital where he stayed for a year, and on the following Valentine's Day, he returned to Valentine Bluffs and murdered the supervisors responsible for the accident. A reasonable response? Afterwards, he decided to get Martha Stewart on their asses and put their hearts in Valentine's boxes. The residents were warned to never have a Valentine's Day dance again. And now there's a group of young adults who aren't taking this seriously. The mayor and chief investigate the gifted heart and find that it is very much real. But they can't confirm whether or not Harry Warden has gotten loose again. But Mabel can! Roses are red, violets are blue, one is dead, and so are you? Goodbye, Mabel. Apparently the best place to hang out after the bar closes is in the junkyard, where you can warm up food on the engine of a car. Here, the tension between Axel and TJ comes to a head over who Sarah should really be with. I got a great idea. How about you ask? Her. Once Valentine's Day rolls around, Chief Newby is still trying to get information on Harry Warden's whereabouts. While he waits, he goes to inform Mabel of what's going on. He does find her. And inside Mabel is another Valentine warning. Surprisingly enough, the mayor and chief do the right thing by canceling the dance, which no one's too happy about. TJ apologizes to Sarah for essentially abandoning her to go elsewhere, and I guess she accepts this apology. TJ then suggests that they have a party on Valentine's Day, since the dance is canceled. I mean, they've even got the perfect place to hold it, a coal mine. Since Happy overheard these plans, he comes up with one of his own. Now that it's Valentine's Day, everybody arrives at the mine to begin their celebration. Harry Warden shows up too and kills Dave, played by Carl Marat, by means of boiling hot dog water. This goes unnoticed because TJ and Axel are trying to beat each other to a pulp, which results in Sarah essentially giving up on both of them. Elsewhere, Sylvia is killed by Harry. At the same time, Hollis, Howard, Mike, Sarah, Patty, and Harriet, played by Terry Waterland, go into the mine unaware of Harry Warden's presence. Back on the surface, Dave and Sylvia's bodies 
have been discovered, and the whole party is sent into a panic. While everyone leaves to get the chief, TJ and Axel go down into the mine to get the others. TJ finds Sarah, Patty, Hollis, and Howard first, and informs them of the situation. He and Hollis leave the group, and Hollis finds Mike and Harriet. They may have been drilled, but Hollis is the one who gets nailed. When Harry appears, Howard takes off, leaving Sarah and Patty to fend for themselves. Axel finds them and leads them towards the elevator. They run into TJ and discover that the controls for the elevator have been busted. So up the ladder they go. Or not. They head through a shortcut to get to the cart, but it seems Axel is the latest to fall victim to Harry. When TJ gets separated from the girls, Patty gets pickaxed. So now, Sarah is on her own. <laughs> Oh no wait, there's TJ. Meanwhile, Chief Newbie arrives with some backup and they head down into the mine. TJ and Sarah come face to face with Harry as they climb along some carts. It's mobile melee! Pickaxe versus shovel. This has got to be a new form of rock, paper, scissors. During this life or death fighting, it's revealed that this minor killer isn't Harry Warden at all. It's Axel. But why would he go around pretending to be Harry to kill people? That's because he's the son of one of those supervisors that the real Harry killed years ago. This is an odd trauma response, but who am I to judge? TJ and Sarah escape when a portion of the mine collapses, trapping Axel. Apparently the chief knew that Harry wasn't the killer as a prior phone call informed him that Harry died five years ago. Didn't want to tell anybody about that just yet, huh? Speaking of, Axel is still alive and lops off an arm in order to get away. Sarah, be my bloody valentine. <laughs> and with the original song, The Ballad of Harry Borden, by John McDermott, the credits roll. My Bloody Valentine fits right in with the other classic 80s slasher movies that we all enjoy. It provides what is wanted from such a film. I feel like the legend surrounding Harry Warden is established and built up well. It lends more to him being a truly imposing figure, and his overall look is unsettling. You can't see his face, and he holds a certain dominating presence. Love triangles can be hit or miss for many people, and I tend to to dislike them. However, this one between Sarah, TJ, and Axel was at least compelling enough to keep me engaged, and I do believe a bit of a queer angle could be read into it. The low-budget grittiness contributes to the overall charm of this film. Valentine Bluff is a small town relying primarily on the coal mine. It works well. The special effects done by Thomas R. Berman are all practical and many of which had to be cut. Since it's theatrical run, those scenes have been added back in for certain editions of the film. They all look quite good. Three Standouts are when Mabel's body is discovered, Happy getting the pickaxe through the jaw, and out his eye, and when Sylvia is impaled on the shower head. There are some smart characters here, which is shocking given the subgenre and era. When bodies are discovered, a large majority of the group leave out of self preservation and to get the police. It does take a bit for the action of the story to get going, so it can certainly be slow for a lot of people. The twist of Axel actually being the killer probably isn't too difficult to pick out early on, but it could still be a deal and surprise to many. At the very least, I didn't roll my eyes at it. I do have to say I really like that none of the actors were told who the killer was until the very end, including the killer himself. I think that really helped with how their characters were portrayed. Perhaps the acting isn't terribly good here. It's not difficult to go along with and falls into the campy category fairly well. I don't find any of it to be unbearable. Two specific actors I enjoyed watching were Keith Knight and Paul Kelman. The score by Paul Zaza is fine, but the only thing that really stands out for me is The Ballad of Harry Warden, which, like I said earlier, is performed by John McDermott. That is beautiful, and I consider it to be a pro. With all that being said, I'm giving My Bloody Valentine 7 out of 10 bloody thumbs up. I would definitely suggest watching this as the unrated version, with all the cutscenes included. This is a fun slasher for Valentine's Day, or any other day, really. It fulfills what you expect from an 80s horror movie in this category. I can't say it's the best slasher out there, especially with all the the other 80s horror movies we have, but it's not a waste either. A rather dedicated fan base has grown around it over the decades, and we even got a remake in the later 2000s. I'm always pleased to see people enjoying this movie around February, and while we don't have a lot of Valentine themed horror movies to choose from, I believe it's one of the better ones. I would recommend My Bloody Valentine to people looking for a horror movie to watch with a special someone, can exploitation fanatics, gore and practical effects enthusiasts, and anyone who would like to see a better love triangle than Twilight. See you later. If you're looking for more slasher films, check out my reviews of these movies. Thank you to my patrons Michael Museo, Bronson Wright Wolf, Diana Moe, Sean Sheridan, and Raiders AK for supporting the channel.